Hello everyone, this is the last video of the dinosaur phylogeny series. We have traveled through dinosaur ancestors, sauropodomorphs, ornithischians, and most theropods. Today we are going to finish the theropods, so let's jump right in. <laughs> We've come a long way from Capturinus, that little lizard-like diapsid from the Permian. From there, we went through increasingly inclusive clades including Diapsida, Archosauromorpha, Archosauria, Avimetatarsalia, Ornithodira, and Dinosauromorpha before coming to the first dinosaurs, noting all their morphological commonalities along the way. We discussed the first dinosaurs as well as the sauropodomorphs and the ornithischians, but this video is going to cover the last of the theropods. To retrace our steps in Theropoda, we went through Neotheropoda, Avarostra, Titanurae, Avitheropoda, Coelurosauria, Tyranoraptora, Manoraptoriformes, Manoraptora, Pinoraptora, Paraves, Eumanoraptora, and stopped at Aviale. All clades first originated with a single progenitor species after it speciated from other lineages. This initial distinction between this progenitor and its sister species, which would start their own respective clades, would have been very subtle. Thus, under evolution, we would expect that the earliest members of a new clade would look extremely similar to members of other closely related clades. We saw this in the earliest dinosaurs, Pachycephalosaurs and Ceratopsians, and Tyrannosaurs and Compsognathids. Unsurprisingly, birds are no exception. In fact, there is such a smooth transition from dinosaurs to birds, such that it becomes difficult to define the difference between birds and non-avian dinosaurs. As we have seen in the previous videos, the long list of seemingly unique bird traits didn't appear all at once. These traits evolved sequentially on the line leading to birds, as they are broadly distributed among dinosaurs. And, the traits themselves often evolve through different stages at different points, which is especially the case with feathers. At this point, drawing the line between birds and non-avian dinosaurs is very arbitrary. Jacques Gauthier identified four different ways to define aves, or birds. The first definition, panaves, is quite broad as it includes pterosaurs and all dinosaurs. The second definition, avifilopluma, includes anything that has feathers, which would mean that anything from feathered tyrannosaurus to dromaeosaurs are birds too. The last two definitions are the most commonly used ones, which are aviale, defined as anything closer to extant birds than either Troodon or Dromaeosaurus, or the crown group Neorniths, which Gauthier favors. Now, aviale is characterized by having members that flap their wings for flight, and the earliest members of this clade first appeared in the late Jurassic, some 165 million years ago. Early members of Aviale, unsurprisingly, look very similar to their close cousins in Dromaeosauridae, so much so, in fact, that some previously considered Avialans have been identified in some studies as Dromaeosaurs, such as Shautingia. Other nearbirds continually float around the Paraves, including Anchiornis, Aurornis, Petapenna, and Balar. Nothing says evolution quite like a series of fossils with characteristics of both ancestral and daughter clades. Why is it so difficult to classify these fossils? Well, for one thing, these genera each have teeth and a long bony tail completely unlike any modern birds, but like earlier dinosaurs. Archaeopteryx, for instance, has these dinosaurian features in addition to a non-horn-covered maxilla and premaxilla, free trunk region vertebrae, an unfused ischium and pubis, a neck attached to the skull from the rear, not the bottom, a sacrum that occupies six vertebrae, free metacarpals with a flexible wrist hand joint, claws on three unfused digits, a fibula length equal to the tibia, and free metatarsals among other characters. Some features of Archaeopteryx even caused it to be classed as a dromaeosaurid in the 2011 paper, an Archaeopteryx-like theropod from China and the origin of aviale, although this conclusion is generally unsupported in phylogenetic analyses. The vast majority of studies agree that Archaeopteryx is one of the most primitive avialans. Aurornis and Anchiornis were previously placed as basal avialans more primitive than Archaeopteryx, but more recent analyses have tended to conclude that these two, along with at least Eosynopteryx, form a family sister to Troodontidae. Pedipenna has also been considered a basal avialan as well as a member of the family containing Anchiornis. 
and Balar has flipped between being a Dromaeosaurid and Avialan, with the most recent analyses placing it as a primitive Avialan. So at this point, not a whole lot is separating Avialans from dinosaurs. A number of characteristic features of modern birds, including feathers, bipedality, and pneumatic bones, were already present in earlier dinosaurs, if not in earlier archosaurs. We saw that feathers likely were originally used for insulation and or mating displays in the previous video, meaning they came to be used for flight secondarily. Researchers recognize that feathers, like our hair, are highly modified scales, in their case archosaurian skin placodes, and the steps of how flight feathers originated have been teased out. The earliest protofeather was just a tubular structure called a collar. Later, the collar differentiated, producing bar bridges that grew unbranched keratin filaments. The filaments then fused at their base to form a central filament. This was followed by that central filament developing filaments along it. The fine filaments on modern feathers are called barbs. In a Manoraptor and dinosaur, a number of these barbs then fused on the anterior midline of the follicle to form the rachis, that structure that goes down the middle of a feather. Originally, the barbs would have been single branches, but over time they developed their own branches, called barbules. And genetic work has been done here too, according to the 2010 paper, Genomic Organization and Molecular Phylogenies of the Beta Keratin Multigene Family in the Chicken and Zebra Finch Implications for Feather Evolution. Quote, Our results suggest the following scenario for the evolution of the Beta Keratin Gene Family. The genome of early archosaurians contained a cluster of beta-keratin genes closely related to the scale beta-keratin genes seen in today's crocodilians and birds. Duplication and diversification led to the subfamily known as claw, which provided additional building blocks for the evolution of archosaurian appendages, i.e. claws, beaks, spurs, etc. In fact, members of both the scale and claw subfamilies of beta-keratin are present in developing claws, beaks, scales, and even feathers of birds. As the development and morphogenesis of the epidermal appendages diversified further, recombination in the beta-keratin gene cluster provided the raw material for the evolution of new beta-keratin genes such as feather and feather-like, which would eventually provide the structural proteins for appendages with novel functions such as the feather. In fact, our molecular phylogenies demonstrate that the avian claw genes evolved from the scale genes and form a basal group to the feather-like and feather genes." Close quote. Second, bipedality was not only in dinosaurs, but also the ancestors of dinosaurs. And third, pneumatic bones have been found as far back in the archosaurian line as pterosaurs. So then, what happened next? Andrea Coe explains bird evolution in her 2018 paper, The Assembly of the Avian Body Plan, a 160 million year long process. Quote, the second phase, Ostromian stage, second half of Jurassic, is characterized by a higher evolutionary rate, the loss of hypercarnivory, the enlargement of the brain case, the dramatic reduction of the caudofemoral module, and the development of true pinaceous feathers. The transition to powered flight was achieved only in the third phase, Martian stage, Cretaceous, with the reorganization of both forelimb and tail as flight-adapted organs and the full acquisition of the modern bow plan." Close quote. So really, the evolution of birds from earlier theropods involved dropping a lot of structures that got in the way of being a lightweight flyer. For instance, teeth were lost pretty early on in bird evolution, as seen in the early Cretaceous Jixiang Ornus, where the maxilla and premaxilla became encased in horn, forming the beak. And yes, a number of genes involved in this process have been worked out, documented by the 2015 paper, a molecular mechanism for the origin of a key evolutionary innovation, the bird beak and palate, revealed by an integrative approach to major transitions in vertebrate history. The 2016 paper, How to Make a Bird Skull, Major Transitions in the Evolution of the Avian Cranium, Petamorphosis, and the Beak as a Surrogate Hand, discusses how the face shortened while the brain case became enlarged, and the enlargement of the brain case was evidently related to the loss of two theropod bones surrounding the eye, the prefrontal and postorbital. As it happens, these bones do appear briefly during bird embryonic development, but fuse into the nasal and frontal bones becoming undetectable in adults. Avialans also fused and lost a number of other bones to help in flight. Essentially, the fewer moving parts, the easier flight became. Within Aviale, the clade Ava brevicata contains all the Avialans with tails containing ten or fewer vertebrae, such as Sapiornis, and the vertebrae continued to fuse until all that was left was the small pigostyle. 
Birds with a pigostyle are found in the clade appropriately named Pigostylia, and mostly fall into Confucius ornithiformes or ornithothoraces, the latter of which contains modern birds. Confucius ornithiformes are known from the early Cretaceous of China, and like Archaeopteryx, they still have claws for tree climbing. And by the way, some of the genetics involved in the formation of the pigostyle have been worked out by researchers, as documented by the 2014 paper, From Dinosaurs to Birds, A Tale of Evolution. Within ornithothoraces, we find enantiorniths, the so-called opposite birds, and euorniths. The enantiorniths are named for their shoulder bones, which are oriented oppositely compared to modern birds, and from the early to late Cretaceous were the predominant bird form. Along the way to the modern birds, collectively classified as neorniths or aves, birds underwent a number of other changes. They fused the carpal and metacarpal bones to form the carpometacarpus, the tibia fused with some tarsal bones to form the tibiotarsus, the fibula greatly reduced, other tarsal and metatarsal bones fused to form the tarsometatarsus, the sacrum fused with a number of vertebrae to form the sensacrum, a number of hand bones fused, we'll get back to this shortly, and the ischium fused to the pubis, among other things. Interestingly, when birds develop embryonically, they still start out with an unfused ischium and pubis, just like their cousin dromaeosaurs and troodontids, but these become fused later. Lastly, what about those hand bones? Modern bird hands essentially look like a big pointer finger because most of the bones have fused. The only fingers modern birds have are two, three, and four, and for a while, this didn't seem to square with paleontology because dinosaurs often have fingers 1, 2, and 3, except for Limusaurus, as we saw in the last video. This was eventually explained via the frame shift hypothesis, where a mutation caused the fingers being expressed to basically move over by one on login, the blobby buds from which the distinct fingers form. A few other hypotheses regarding developmental changes have been proposed, and in every case there is a completely natural explanation for the bird hand. So, the evolution of birds from earlier theropods is backed by mountains of evidence. We can see the step-by-step -step evolution of characters in the fossil record, and researchers can work out what genes were at play in a number of cases. Remember that this series started out in the Permian with small lizard-like amniotes. We progressed through the different dinosaur clades and ended up at the modern dinosaurs, the birds. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.